Hello, everybody. I think you can probably hear me. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you all to this panel conversation around responsible reporting on suicide. We're still waiting for a few people to join, including one of our panelists, Kelly McBride, who's joining us from the States. But in the meantime, I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the Ethical Journalism Network, which is the organization of which I'm the director, to this fascinating, what I know will be a fascinating discussion on responsible reporting on suicide and mental health. It was World Mental Health Day this weekend, and we have a great group of panelists joining us. Um, I'd just like to introduce them briefly. They will then introduce themselves and talk about some of their areas of interest. Our moderator today is James Longman. He's an ABC foreign correspondent who has spoken openly about his experience of mental ill health. Uh, we've got Dr. Anne Luce and Dr. Sally Ann Duncan, who are the co-creators of the Suicide Reporting Toolkit. We have Richard Addy, who is a um, expert in media strategy, strategic advisor, and is a trustee of the um, Mind uh, Mental Health Charity in the United Kingdom. And joining us very shortly will be Kelly McBride, Senior Vice President from the Pointer Institute in the United States. Just a little bit of housekeeping, if that's okay, please. Um, if I could ask you if you have any questions, could you please put them in the chat function and address them to me? Um, I will then be able to pass those questions to the um, people on the panel. And um, we're aiming to have a panel-wide discussion for about an hour. And then, unfortunately, James will have to leave us, but I will then moderate the questions afterwards. This, will all, this is all being recorded. It will be tweeted. Um, and so if there's anything um, that you are not comfortable speaking about openly that will be recorded, please note um, that it might be more appropriate to be having private conversations afterwards about this. So without further ado, you're all muted at the moment. And if you would, if you would stay so, please, and just allow our panellists to unmute themselves. Um, without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to James Longman. Thanks, James. Thanks so much, Hannah. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I think this is going to be a really interesting panel and fascinating to hear uh, about what some of these panelists have been working on to make sure we're all doing a better job of reporting on suicide and mental health. I have a real interest in this. My father sadly ended his life uh, when I was young and I went through a depression in my 20s. I've tried to report on my own experience and I've fallen down in many ways so I'm, I'm fascinated to hear about this. We've got uh, Richard Addy who is a trustee of MIND. He's a former chief advisor to the Director General of the BBC and he now runs a consultancy trying to make News organisations do a better job of reporting on things like this. Anne Luch and Sally Ann Duncan are both uh, professors in journalism at the University of Strathclyde and Bournemouth University, and they've developed a toolkit for journalists and newsrooms to better report something actually kind of material that we can actually use rather than just talking about things, I suppose, in principles. And then finally, Kelly McBride from the Pointer Institute. Uh, she's a senior vice president there, and she's also public editor of NPR. I'm interested to hear her perspective from the United States. I also work for a US broadcaster. We are sometimes guilty of sensationalizing things. So uh, I suppose maybe Richard Addy, would you like to kick off? Uh, just talk about where you're most interested in this. What are we doing well with mental health reporting and what are we doing badly? Where, we, where could we do better? Uh, thanks, James. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me on this panel. Um, I think from a, a from the perspective of both being a, a trustee of uh, mine, but also uh, the organization that I run um, with my co-founder, Luba Gasova, we are interested in not just at a, uh, importantly at a journalist level, but at, a, at an operational level, how change happens, um, how we can have uh, tackling more responsible uh, reporting. So we think about it on three levels. The first level is um, the societal context, obviously and, and and the good news is that over the last few years we've seen uh, a reduction in, in stigma of mental health uh, and society uh, the conversations beginning to open up so that's a good thing uh, but we need to take account of that in societal context that journalists are in secondly is the organizational level uh, uh, the kind of strategies the leadership the rituals in newsrooms having a look at that and then thirdly, at an individual level, what does a journalist do individually uh, to help their reporting be better? Um, we, we think that quite a lot of attention, rightly so, has been spent at the individual level with guidelines, um, which, uh, which we know many journalists aren't aware of. 
But I think I, I'm particularly interested in at an organizational level, how can we bake in the right approaches in organizational strategies, uh, in organizational approaches, uh, so that the responsibility of more effective reporting isn't just on the shoulders of journalists, individual journalists, but they are helped by the organization. So that's on the reporting side, but also workplace well-being, um, uh, especially if people are from ethnic minority backgrounds or for women, there's a much bigger responsibility for news organizations to recognize the additional challenges, especially in the COVID age that these groups face. So I'm interested in the focus at organization level. What we think is, is being done well is an increasing number of organizations actually um, starting to adopt the guidelines and starting to um, systematically uh, write in the right way. But what isn't working well is the awareness of the guidelines and this is where I think the the the, the brilliant toolkit that's been produced uh, by uh, colleagues on the call will be talked about is a real opportunity to bring it all together but I've, I think I'm obsessed now having looked into this about raising the awareness of these guidelines and these ways forward. Great and so on that note then Anne first up, first up what where do you think things are going well where do you think they're going badly and talk us through this toolkit. Okay, well, it's lovely to be here with everyone today. So thanks so much to Hannah and the Ethical Journalism Network for pulling this together. Um, where are we going well? Well, I think within society, we're talking about mental health. So that's a positive. Um, we're not afraid to talk about mental health. So I think we, we've made some strides there, especially over the last 10 to 20 years in that, in that aspect. Um, where we're going badly, however, is I think, as Richard said, we're not following the guidelines. Um, you know, the World Health Organization guidelines um, have been out for over 20 years. I'm still talking to journalists around the world who don't even know they exist. Um, the Samaritans have guidelines and have just recently uh, updated and created an amazing um, toolkit, well, uh, some guidelines for journalists in terms of how to, Im you know, They've updated their guidelines and they've created a more uh, richer online platform uh, for journalists where they can go. But Sally Ann and I completed a piece of research last year that actually showed that, you know, 36% of journalism students in the UK don't even know the Samaritans guidelines exist. Now, the Samaritans guidelines are guidelines that journalism organizations around the UK have allegedly signed up to and have said that they will use. but yet journalism students, so universities, there's no pre-service education for journalism students. Um, so, and then on top of that, we also then have the historical macho newsroom where journalists perhaps are not supposed to have feelings and they're not supposed to be upset by stories. And we have, as journalists, we're notorious for having our coat of armor of objectivity. You know, nothing beats us, nothing gets through that armor. Um, so that when a journalist is feeling a bit, you know, upset by perhaps a personal experience having been affected by suicide or covering, you know, in my case, it was covering Hurricane Katrina. Um, you know, I mean, whatever the story is, you know, mental health, we all have mental health, including journalists. Um, where the toolkit came into this, where Sally Ann and I co created this toolkit, was we've been researching in this area for donkey's years. I mean, I've been doing suicide prevention research and media for the last 15 years. And I'm kind of fed up with journalists always being pointed at and saying, you're the reason why suicide rates are climbing. You're the reason why. Um, and there's all this research that shows that journalists don't cover the story correctly. Their stories do, do cause harm. But what we wanted to do was instead of just having this research, let's put it into practice. Let's help journalists better report on suicide and mental health. So Sally Ann and I came up with the idea of the toolkit. Um, we've spent, we've used all the underpinning research and the world guidelines on uh, suicide prevention that are available to journalists across the world. We used all of that to underpin the toolkit. So the toolkit is based solidly within the research that is already out there. So when journalists use the toolkit and it's uh, www.suicide reporting toolkit.com for anyone who's not familiar um, but 
our, our goal is that when journalists use this, they can use it on deadline. They can use it if they want to educate themselves before they have to do a story. There's an aspect there for journalism educators as well um, with lesson plans. So how do they teach journalism? So it's still evolving and we want feedback. So if anyone on the call here today, you know, has a look at it and has some, you know, information or, you know, guidance or advice on how we can, you know, make it better, we're totally up to that. Sally Ann, um, it does seem to me that there's a, a kind of the missing link here is just educating journalists. I mean, I know a lot of us don't go to journalism school, um, but I remember, and I started and I was, I never went, but I remember my first shift at Sky News when I was a young video, I was uh, writing in articles online overnight. I remember the first story I did was when Whitney Houston died and I spent the night crying writing this article. Um, was, uh, so is there was an emphasis on media law. It was this one thing that everyone in the room was like obsessed that I know. Even I hadn't been to journalism school, but they needed me to know about media law because there was like litigious consequences for me not knowing and making a mistake. It seems to me that there needs to be some kind of emphasis in that respect, not just in newsrooms, but at, at universities, perhaps a module on reporting on mental health that is kind of a, a necessity in a year long master's course or a th three year journalism course. I mean, you guys, teach at university? Is there space for that? Is that realistic? Would there be an interest at universities? Um, I think there is an interest at universities uh, quite clearly um, and some universities uh, have something like uh, 50 plus journalism schools in the UK um, and, and most of those will offer some form of media ethics tuition um, whether it's a module in media ethics or journalism ethics or it's media ethics and regulation and the law. Um, so there is some tuition in the broader subject, um, but the specifics of um, reporting mental health issues and suicide and death and trauma, um, these uh, tend to be maybe addressed in an afternoon, a couple of hours um, in a, a 10 week module. Um, unless, like Anne, uh, Anne delivers a whole course in trauma, a whole uh, module in trauma. Um, but the problem is that the curriculum is squeezed because there's so many things that we have to teach our students as journalism educators, whether it's at undergraduate level or at postgraduate level. And um, we tend to, as educators, be focusing on um, news production, um, on storytelling, on the mechanics of journalism. Um, although I think many, many courses now do take that sort of moral, ethical approach in, they embed it within their um, reporting classes. Um, so that is one way forward. And also, um, you know, we have uh, an association in the UK called the Association for Journalism Educa Educators um, and um, our uh, president is actually on, on this call, so um, here she is. Uh, and that is a wonderful institution where we can get together as journalism educators and we can um, swap ideas, we can present research, um, we get lots of support there um, and that and we, our toolkit is um, listed with them as well so that uh, we are trying to expand the possibility of that education um, and we can do it through organisations like that but it is, it is a problem in actually fitting that into the curriculum. So you mentioned the mechanics of reporting a story it seems to me that that is a way that just needs to be embedded into what you do when you sit down and you write something or you're about to film something. Can you talk me through using the toolkit? If let's say, for example, I'm someone, I'm sitting on the wires, it's three o'clock in the morning, um, news breaks of uh, someone in the public eye, for example, who's ended their life. Um, and over the next few hours as news is reportable, what would you do differently? What, how would that toolkit then help an individual sitting down at their computer? What could they do? Check things off. Um, well, one thing they can do is that um, our toolkit tends to emphasise what they can do rather than what they can't do. Many of the guidelines will say, um, don't do this, don't do that. And that, that can actually create grey areas. So journalists don't, well, they, they may know what to do, but it, it leaves them in a quandary. Um, so, you know, when they go onto our toolkit, they can look for the specific thing that is bothering them. Um, it could be how to do a death knock. Um, so there's information 
on the, the section for journalists um, on how to report a death note. It could be they want to know what's the best way to do an infographic without it being offensive. Um, so they can go to that section. Um, there's sections on where to place the word suicide within the story. So it's, it's very pragmatic um, and we've designed it in that way so that they can search for what they want within the, the, the thing that's bothering them about the story they're reporting. Yeah, pra practical solutions is what's needed for journalists, I think. They need literally to be held by the hand as they go through the process, don't they? Anne, sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, we've also created the Responsible Suicide Reporting Model. And so what that actually does, talking about that systematic process, it we've identified what are the key stories that journalists actually write around suicide. So we've identified there's five story types in the cycle of a suicide story. And so the first one is going to be event driven. So it's going to be 3 a.m. a suicide has happened. So you've identified that this is what the type of story is. Then we take you through a process and it's all on the website. We take you through that next step. Once you've identified the story, you now get to apply four ethical rules. So you're not sensationalizing, you're not stigmatizing, glorifying suicide or glamorizing it. And we give examples about what that actually means. From there, we then ask journalists to apply a standard of moderation. And the standard of moderation is six questions. Um, it's have I minimized harm to those who've been affected by suicide? Have I told the truth yet ex you know, avoided explicit details of the method or the location? which is really important. Have I taken care in producing the story, including my tone and language? Have I used social media responsibly? Have I avoided stereotypes, harmful content, stigmatizing stories? And have I provided support via helplines? Because in research we've completed this past year, we've shown that 60% of stories in the UK still do not have a support helpline along with the story. Now there's no excuse for that. There just isn't. It's I don't understand why it doesn't go. I mean, it's not difficult to like read past something that has a disclaimer. I mean, before this conversation, before any conversation I've ever had on mental health in a public forum, the first yeah. thing that the moderator will say is that there are issues that are going to be discussed here. Please be aware that there is help you can go. I mean, it's just what you do in face to face. So why wouldn't you do it? I don't understand why they're, they're just not for the article rather than after. It's a strange And thing. what's really interesting, James, is we have a massive body of research evidence that shows that just by placing a helpline with a story, journalists can prevent suicide from happening. Mm. It's not difficult to put the Samaritan's helpline you know, at the end of a story or papyrus for young people aged, you know, six to 16. You know, it, it doesn't take that much, but we know that it's one of the most crucial things that journalists need to do that they're not doing. Um, so, so to go back to your example of the 3 a.m. story, once a journalist has identified the story, applied the four ethical rules and now asked themselves those six questions, because this model is underpinned by all of the research and the guidelines, the global guidelines that are out there, a journalist is now following global guidelines on reporting suicide. Their story is in that middle way. It's not sensationalized, but it's also they're able to cover the story without feeling censored. So yeah. it is that middle way. And it's a very simple process for journalists to follow. Richard, I'm interested in your conversations with news providers and others in the media industry when we talk about this idea of celeb you know sensationalizing the news and the pressures that are individuals are under you know just anecdotally the daily mail for example if you're writing for the daily mail online any one writer will have a target number of stories they need to generate in a 24-hour period or a shift you know um how realistic is it that these individuals can be expected to adhere to these guidelines? How, how much of an effort are newsrooms making to make sure they are? Um, what, what are you hearing? Uh, well, the challenge really is, and the term guideline in itself um, will make most journalism cry, journalists cry, I suppose. So it's how, how, we frame, uh, how we frame this whole approach. Is it about guidelines and being told off if you get something wrong, which is quite a defensive positioning, or is there an opportunity for it to be a much more proactive um, positioning, which is, uh, as Anne and, um, has, has outlined, an opportunity to write uh, the right story, a story that is creatively put together, 
but also there's a kind of framing around uh, mental health and um, and uh, suicide stories which again has that sense of um, journalists who are, may lack confidence maybe a bit scared um, want to do the right thing uh, and I'm also interested in, in flipping that and thinking about how powerful journalism can be in helping the right behaviors um, I, I don't want to say that journalism is a public health tool but certainly in the age of COVID it is a public health tool and journalists do play a role in saving and enhancing lives so there's an opportunity um, to help journalists and organizations not think about this in a defensive way but think about it in a way they have of, of improving people's lives and well-being in society uh, but having said all that that's a kind of perfect picture I would say that in our conversations this area doesn't um, this area doesn't uh, come up um, in, in an all in a um, from a perspective of the news organizations it's something we have to bring up so there's an enormous um blind spot i would say here the is is that there's so many i mean particularly i just think of some of the news uh, you know print mag print newspapers in this country or their online services the number of people in the public eye who've ended their own lives just in the last 12 months i mean it's amazing that it's not coming up in those conversations yeah. find that uh, it, it is and there's one other dimension that, um, and we are still at the foothills in many organizations, but there's another dimension which I think is incredibly important. Over the last 10 years or so, we find that news organizations are becoming much more sensitive to their audiences and their audiences' needs. And we know that in the UK, um, in, in, in people's lifetime, one in five people will have suicidal thoughts. Uh, and so that there is something there about being sensitive to where your audience is uh, and journalists care about that dimension and one of those and, and we know that in any one time one in four people are living with a mental health challenge in over people's lifetime probably half the population so just in terms of being relevant to your audiences um, trying to engage in this area having the right conversations um, opening up when you're struggling and how to write about it can be very authentic and open you know we're, we're all struggling in in various degrees in this space so there's an opportunity just from a purely audience perspective too yeah go sally Ann, please i i just wanted to add um the corollary to that actually because i think you're right um i think uh, that news outlets are becoming much more sensitive to their audience and they should be thinking about their audiences more and also the journalist's role as a key worker during this COVID uh, pandemic and the importance of the, the journalist's role in um, a public service and um, uh, you know serving their community etc but I think what we're also finding is though that um, there are especially within the sort of big corporate organisations, there's a pressure on, on the individual journalists in the newsroom to create certain types of stories that are going to drive traffic to the websites. Um, and that therefore, it's, it's about clicks now. It's, it's, it's also about addressing the audience, but it's about making sure that that, that, that audience is audited. Um, and the way to do that is to increase um, the type the, the, or to change the types of stories that are being done that the stories are not necessarily about public service journalism they're about entertainment engagement um, and, and you know an engaging story can be about something really quite ridiculous my fear is that if we extend that beyond the sort of current level of story um, that we will see a, an increase in sensationalism in suicide stories we know that they are already attractive to readers um, and that the way that they are currently written um, presents a problem for the suicide prevention um, associations and groups um, but if this is going to increase uh, and that there's a drive towards sensationalism then that could have a really adverse effect and and it's not necessarily that the journalists who are writing these stories want to do that so they're actually in a moral dilemma as well because they and often the headline is out, outside of their control you write your copy and someone else will write the headline yeah but they're not even been given guidance on how to write you know that's a template type story so yeah. if, that is, I could just see that there would be an erosion and um, the, the good work that 
um, some publications are doing and that many of us are trying to do to improve reporting. But I have to emphasise that my uh, anecdotal evidence is that at grassroots, most journalists want to behave ethically. They don't want to do these sorts of sensationalist type stories. So it's how we, we solve those sorts of problems. I actually had an experience with this myself because, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, my father ended his life and I, and I didn't know much about the circumstances. And I went to a bit of research and found, and he sadly, um, he, was, he had schizophrenia and he sadly uh, set light to his home and then he jumped out a window. But he, uh, the article, the headline of the newspaper, which I found, had flat blaze death leap on the front. I mean, that was the, the way that they described it. And I'm sure that the person writing that article had no intention to cause anyone in my family kind of any real harm. But it was just the way that that day's edition of the Kensington News, as it was then, doesn't exist anymore, uh, was going to sell its newspaper. Um, so I kind of do get it. But there is, there is another way that perhaps we can kind of tackle it, in my, in my view, which is that one, one motivator for news organisations is the click, as you say, sally Ann. It's that one headline. You need to, you, they need to get your attention. They need to click it. But the other metric that a lot of them care about now is the engagement and how long you're on the article for. And so if there's an emphasis on trying to convince news organisations that the way to keep people reading is not necessarily to terrify them, in my experience as a journalist, um, actually, it's the good stuff that keeps people engaged. And we're very sneering in newsrooms about, you know, stories about pandas and the snow and children. And they're the things that only people care about. And there's a reason for that, because people want to be happy. They don't want to be constantly reminded of sadness all the time. And there was a thing, there was a phrase that we used when I was at the BBC called solutions based journalism. And that wasn't about, you know, there's been, a, you know, a horrible event over here. Let's go and spend a lot of time talking to all these people over here who've suffered in this horrible event and leave it there. What we should do is go and talk to all the other places where that didn't happen and assess why they've managed to buck the trend elsewhere and give people at home a solution. So I wonder maybe that's a way to suggest, and, and by the way, anything that is solutions based always got much more engagement from the audience it, it, because they don't want to come away from the news feeling awful. And the number of, how many times has anyone on this panel or watching heard, I don't watch the news anymore because it's just really depressing. I mean, it's a phrase you hear all the time. And in my work, anyway, what we try to do is, yes, highlight something that's not gone very well, but maybe also point out the ways that other things have gone well elsewhere so that people aren't constantly... So maybe that's a solution to move away from the clickbait issue into the level of engagement in a story or how long you watch a video for. We do know that, um, you know, positive stories about mental health and suicide, so people who have overcome a suicide attempt or someone who has overcome their mental health challenge in some way, we do know that those stories have pre preventative factors, you know, so when, when the audience engages with those stories, they, you know, there's a, oh, okay, I'm feeling, I, I had similar problems there. Oh, I can get help too. And, you know, and so those types of stories, we know globally, again, the research base is there for that. Where we start having the problems with that is when you then start taking it outside of the arena of journalism and into the world of public health and the NHS and government and funding. And, you know, so it, it's, it's real complex because journalists can do these amazing jobs, but then obviously Obviously, if you're going to be signposting people, I mean, I don't know, maybe I was one of the only people on the call this weekend who was watching the Britain's Got Talent uh, final this weekend, but um, a bit of downtime. But actually, one of the, um, they did this break with Ant and Deck, and it was to raise money for helplines in the UK, because during COVID, people have been calling helplines more. So on Britain's Got Talent, they're asking people to donate 10 or 20 pounds during a global pandemic, when we know people are losing their jobs and probably don't have the money for that, to be able to offer a service that's supposed to help them with their mental health. And, you know, and it just kind of, you know, my question was, well, why isn't the government supporting this? Why are yeah. we asking everyday people? But it is on one on one level, that's rather nice because it, it suggests is. ITV understand their audience now, a younger audience, is engaged in these issues. And perhaps, you know, these are issues I find that young people are so much, they care so much more about, you know, their mental health than they're more aware of it in a way that perhaps their, their parents aren't or aren't are willing to talk about. And that's also got to be a really... Kind of hopeful sign for journalism in general right i think you know if these people are going to be our consumers yeah 
over the next 20, 30 years, if they care already. So it shows there, and that, yeah. you know, but it also means, knows that it's an issue and the audience cares about it. But it also means though those young people are also going to be demanding a better type of journalism yeah. from the rest of us in yeah. terms of better responsible and ethical reporting of mental health. Yeah. And, that, and, and <laughs> just to build on that and, and, and the point James made around um, solutions based journalism uh, and moving on, uh, moving on from clickbait. Um, one of the one of the uh, challenges we put to news organizations is that in the short term, you might be able to uh, increase your users online and with 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 that kind of journalism. But is it sustainable? Uh, and um, your reputation, especially in the space where you know that the, your audiences are becoming much more aware, aware, especially young audiences of the right type of, of journalism around mental health, then you will be damaging your long-term viability if you go down this line. So short-term profits, long-term losses. And so that sense of think more strategically about where you want to position your newsroom, uh, given the trends in society and given your audience's needs is very important. Sally Ann, I think you unmuted yourself in the hope that you might make a point or a view. Well, uh, Richard's kind of made it uh, more eloquently than I could. Um, but I was just going to pick up on the solutions journalism uh, aspect of it. I mean, th this is something that um, I think is uh, a way forward for us uh, if we are pointing them in the right direction to where they can get support and there is that underpinning from government. Um, but it is something that we should probably be teaching our students as well um, because it's an alternative, um, it's another way of looking at uh, how to do journalism. Um, and uh, just to clarify in case anyone doesn't know, it's not about the journalists finding solutions, it's about the journalists pre uh, presenting certain alternative ways of, of um, dealing with a story. So instead of it being about a negative story necessarily, it can be turned into a story about hope or about promoting life instead of um, reporting death. Um, so I think that is a way forward. I think we should be teaching it to our students. Um, there are some journalism schools that are doing that, that we're beginning to see signs of that. Um, but uh, it's that I think there must be other narratives there that we can address as well, that we can look at, that we can persuade journalists and news outlets to pursue as well, instead of this standard sort of negative approach to reporting suicide and mental health issues. Although, to be fair, mental health reporting has improved a little bit. In there you go, there's the positivity. <laughs> um, yeah, on the solutions-based thing, it is extraordinary, uh, you know, the reaction you'll get from the audience when you just give them a bit of hope. And the example I sometimes give on this is, uh, and it's not strictly about mental health, but during the Bataclan attacks, you'll remember in Paris a few years ago, very sad, uh, it was tragic. I mean, in just about every way, everyone knows what happened was just awful. But one of the individuals affected was a, a young lady who had been killed. Her husband then decided to write a poem, uh, sorry, write a letter to the attackers, forgiving the attackers. Um, on his wife's behalf and saying, I'm going to tuck my kids in tonight and I'm not going to, I'm not going to teach them hate, I'm going to teach them forgiveness. And what we, the BBC, when I was at the BBC, we got him to read this straight down the barrel of the lens. And it became the most watched piece of digital content at the BBC, far outstripped anything that was the kind of news about what was happening in the Bataclan. People really wanted something good to hold on to in a really sad moment. It's such an obvious, clear example to me of how news can be better, but not lose its audience and actually gain an audience. Um, it just really spoke to me. I've always remembered it, it was years ago now. Um, yeah. One thing, sorry, Richard, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, one of the things about solutions-based journalism, you often find that um, newsrooms and journalists are, are a bit queasy about it, because I think it's all very happy clappy and yeah. uh, you know, it's not real news. But one done really well, it's, it's very in-depth, it's research, it's evidence-based, it's looking at what's worked as well as the, the challenges. Um, and so really, it's, it's real journalism, not happy-clappy journalism. And then secondly, just to reiterate the point you're making, um, in the organisations we've worked with, when we've looked at the, uh, in, uh, the data, so that unique users, um, comments, shares, uh, for many solutions-based journalism stories, it is extraordinary the difference it makes. And, and, you're, uh, and when you pick on the emotions 
that that, journ that journalism elicits in audiences, that sense of hope, when they get a sea of depression, frankly, it really is quite powerful. Mm. Uh, I was going to ask you about something slightly unrelated, but something I'm fascinated by, which is how we posit mental health in, in the kind of public, I suppose, consciousness when we're reporting on it. Often to me, it seems that a lot of the reporting on mental health and depression and other things, it's kind of presented as a thought illness. It's something that we can, you know, breathe away or do yoga and suddenly it's fine. And there's a lot of de-scientification, if you like, of mental health, in my view. Now, there's a stream of thought which says, actually, it's, it, it, it actually increases stigma if you start to talk about the scientific reasons behind mental health, you know, whether it's genetic propensity or anything else, trauma that has sort of affected people on kind of a biological level. There are lo there's lots of new science about it, but people say that that stigmatizes because it suggests that people are kind of prone and some people are not, and then you, you're creating two subsets of people. In my view, constantly telling people that this is just something that they've imagined and is thought kind of makes it less serious. And there's a lot of stuff now, I feel, about people who say they've got a mental health problem and they've cured it because they, you know, they breathe in the morning or whatever they do. How do you feel about how mental health is, is presented as this kind of thought issue versus a scientific condition, which we just don't know enough about? Anyone? Oh, um, we'll jump into this one. <laughs> um, okay, so I often say, so, you know, I've been, you know, working in suicide prevention for 15 years, lost my partner to suicide, you know, back in 2005. And ultimately, where I've kind of come down on this is, suicide is the end stage of a mental illness okay but it's a spectrum it's a spectrum of mental illness and there are things that you know can you know that lean more towards a propensity to having a mental illness so we know that trauma in childhood if anyone's looked at the aces the adverse childhood experiences study if there is anything that has happened in childhood any type of abuse, physical, mental, sexual, if there's a trauma that has happened in a child's life, they are now at a higher risk for a mental illness at some point in their life. We can't pinpoint it, but there's something there. If someone has been bereaved by suicide, they are at a significant higher risk of killing themselves themselves within the days, weeks, months, up to two years after the fact. That risk is epic. So, in some cases, we may have someone who says, oh, I have a mental illness and I was able to be mindfully breathing my way through it. And for that person, that might be the case. But their part on that spectrum is perhaps they were down towards the lower end. Maybe it was a low grade depression. And I'm not a clinical psychologist either, but you know, I've read enough about you know, mental illness to be able to see and worked with clinicians from around the world to know that it is a spectrum of mental health. You know, and we all know that from ourselves. We know that, you know, when you're having a bad day, well, your mental health is affected. But that doesn't necessarily mean that just having a bad day compared to how you were feeling lonely and isolated when you were in lockdown back in March or April when you didn't speak to anyone for, you know, six weeks. That's, that's, a, that's further along the spectrum. So, you know, someone who is suffering or, you know, you know, ha has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, um, you know, that is a more serious mental illness than the person who perhaps is, you know, who, who, who's tr having a trouble t troublesome time at work. And that's not to demean it in any way, no. but it is a spectrum. And it, it, in your view, is there a lot of emphasis on that end and not so much on the, because presumably there's a lot of people across the spectrum and it is my view, my non-scientific view, very lay person's view, yeah. there seems to be a lot of emphasis on that to de-biologize somehow mental health. Well, it's the wellness industry, isn't it? I mean, yeah. we're all about, you know, we have this whole wellness industry now where of self-help books and, you know, you can cure yourself and you can help yourself. And the fact of the matter is not everyone can do that. Not everyone can do that. And I would say that feeds into this idea, you know, a lot of a lot of reporting. I was interested to read in your report, 61 percent, is it, of reports in the UK anyway, emphasize the reason why someone might end their life yes. when actually the reason is. It's so complex. James. I no mean, idea. and that's the, 
control the reason we were played, if there was a reason at all, you know? And that's what I mean. Like, how does that feed into our reporting in general about how these issues affect? They're so much more complex exactly. in a country which requires simplicity. So it's very difficult to report these things exactly. in a complex way, you know, and, a new and way. And this is why it's really important for journalists to be addressing the guidelines, you know? So we're looking, there's the World Health Organization guidelines that are available to journalists. There's the Samaritans guidelines in the UK. There's the IPSO, IPSO has guidance. The NUJ has guidance. MediaWise has guidance, you know? Now we can talk in, you know, a later time about there's so much guidance that actually people are just going, well, I'm not even going to look yeah. at it because I don't know what's true or what's not. The fact is they all are true and they're all pretty much saying the same thing, which is why we've created the toolkit then to kind of help that. But the fact of the matter is when suicide and mental illness is a complex issue, it is a complicated issue. So when journalists actually try to reduce the why of suicide down to, oh, it was a relationship breakdown. Oh, they lost their job. Oh, they had a mental health problem. It really is quite problematic. And every guideline tells you not to do that. Uh, I just think about all the stuff about Caroline Flack. You know, when, when, it's all very well these guidelines are in place and I think the day-to-day -day reporting might by osmosis but when a huge story like that breaks all that stuff seems to go out the window it's it extraordinary out the window and that's where journalists in those types of stories journalists have a larger responsibility to mm. follow those guidelines to the letter and you know but the problem is now is that people go yeah but everyone else is doing it yeah Everyone else is doing it and we can't be the organization that looks like that we've, you know, we're behind the eight ball or, you know, we haven't, we're not covering the story correctly. I would say, you know, I would throw the moral gauntlet down and say, stand for something, have some bloody principles for God's sakes. You know, these are people's lives that are being affected. You know, the first thing, you know, in the medical profession, do no harm. Journalists, do no harm. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about do not harm the people who are bereaved by suicide. You know, do not, do not harm her family members. Do not harm her friends. Because actually, the reporting of the Caroline Flack story placed every single person who was a close personal friend or family member at a significantly higher rate and risk of suicide in the days following her death. What journalist wants that on their conscience? What media organization wants that on their conscience? I don't think anyone does, but we throw our hands up and we say, no, not my problem. Everyone's doing it, not my issue. Mm. I think it's interesting that using that example and about what level do we go in? Is it, do we kind of, is it, is it the emphasis on the individual journalist or who uh, he or she will have enormous amount of pressure on them to just do the impossible, uh, especially if they're going through personal challenges themselves and traumas themselves, or is it at the organizational level, which has got a, a sense of duty of care, sets the direction of what the journalists do. And uh, you can see that I'm, I'm thinking a lot about at the organizational level, they need to, 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 to take the weight of these responsibilities and create spaces for the journalists to do the, the, the responsible reporting. I think the problem oh go ahead sally -Ann. I, I was just going to say that i think it's um it's actually at the organizational level because um if you leave it to the individual journalists they're going to have to follow the this the line that their um, news organization are taking so the direction comes from above it doesn't come from the journalists the journalists will do what they're asked to do because that's their job and that's what they get paid for um, and it's the, the story will drive what the journalist does as well. Um, but it needs to be an intervention at, um, at organisational level because if, uh, um, as Anne says, if, if an organisation will take a stand and say, no, we're not going to do this, then, you know, that, that means that the reporter themselves does not have to cover that story. Um, and there's nothing wrong with changing things after the fact. I mean, if, an, if, if a senior manager or an editor sees a, a headline which he feels or she feels is wrong, then they should take it, have the guts to take it down. I mean, there's a lot that, you know, because everyone is held to such a high standard, particularly online, and they're keen to shoot people down. If a news organization shows any weakness, they feel like they've sort of admitted that they've done something wrong. But actually in these cases, it's so important to get it right that if something just isn't, isn't worded properly, they should have the, the guts and the fortitude to, to take the tweet or take the headline down. 
Well, I also wonder if it's the way that um, that the news media actually look at celebrities, the way that they they, they sort of categorise celebrities. I mean, um, generally, if they're reporting on a cel celebrity and not a death, um, but you know, just the sort of general day-to-day um, -day activities that uh, are reported, then they're fair game. Uh, celebrities are just considered to be fair game. Yeah. Never mind that they're human beings, never mind that they have families or children, um, and those uh, children are innocent, you know, why should they be the ones who are, uh, you know, have their parents dragged through the mud? Um, so it, because of this attitude of, of um, them being fair game, I think that translates a little into their deaths as well, that uh, they're seen as public figures and therefore um, we might get the public interest being cited as a, an explanation as to why that kind of reporting goes on. But surely there's a, a balance in there to, to be um, found between the public interest and the prurience that we get with a lot of these celebrity suicides that are really harmful. What have done with our, oh, sorry, just to make the brief point, what we've done with our organisation at ABC, just on coronavirus, is anything that's written about or reported on when it comes to the science of the illness or the numbers goes through our medical unit. And I, I don't see why, you know, any news organisation, when they're reporting on suicide, shouldn't do the same. Have a doctor look at it. We've all got doctor, big enough news organisations have doctors or medical professionals. You know, if, they've, if, if anything in the guidelines has been missed, there's the last port of call to just make sure before final publication. It's not a difficult process. Do you know where he's getting this right? And who's actually got a really good reputation around mental health reporting and suicide reporting is Australia. Australia has MindFrame, and MindFrame is in um, a coalition between the government, media organisations, and the public. And ultimately, MindFrame goes into newsrooms from the top down um, and educates both editors, media organisations, publishers, you know, all the way down to the journalist who's writing the story and, you know, and educates them about what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. They've been able to reduce, you know, suicide rates in Australia, you know, and Mindframe is being touted as one of the key reasons for that actually to happen because when a journalist, you know, or an organisation gets it wrong, Mindframe is a media immediately on the phone going, hi, so this was a problem, this is what you need to do to correct it, and we would like to come in and do a little bit more training with you, can you fit us in on Friday? And because everyone has signed up to it, it happens. It absolutely happens. Now, you know, there are the people out there who go, oh, well, we don't want government dictating journalism and guidelines and, you know, we don't want things to become law and, you know, our freedom of press and expression and speech and, you know, and yeah, I get that. But they're not, they're not censoring journalists. What they're doing is they're doing that education aspect and really making sure that from the top down has an understanding. Just to pick up on one of the other things that uh, my colleagues have said here, the other issue we have in the UK, and this, you know, it's all great and everything to say, let's go in, um, and Australia is having this problem as well, which is why I'm bringing it up here. It's all great and everything to say, well, let's get the managers and editors all on the same page, and it's an organization level that needs to be structured. That does need to happen, I totally agree. The other issue we're seeing now is that we could have journalists in the UK, every single journalist could be using the guidelines. They are in Australia. So everyone in Australia is using the guidelines. The problem we then have is because we're in this global media environment, we have a sensationalized journalist over at TMZ.com who writes about the suicide of Anthony Bourdain or Kate Spade um, in a really sensationalistic manner. Then the Daily Mail online in the UK decides to pick it up and run it verbatim. Um, and then it's also ran verbatim in Australia. And now you've got a bigger issue. You know, so it's in, in, in terms of this reporting, this is not just something that's in our little microcosms in our own countries. We have to approach responsible and ethical reporting of mental health and suicide prevention on a global media scale. And that's well, I was ask actually about that, because I've seen a difference. I as a British journalist, I work for an American organization and there are some things I feel that we do very well. Um, one thing I've noticed in American media, just generally anecdotally, is this phrase, which I always hear now because I had a manager at the BBC who was obsessed with it, 
not saying the word commit when someone ends their life. Um, and she was just so funny about it. Every time anybody said it or it was in any, she would just, and she'd actually call down to online. She'd have things changed. But you hear it a lot in America. They use the word a lot and they haven't really. And maybe because in general parlance in America, they don't say to commit a crime. I don't know. I mean, I, I just, it, maybe it's more of an English thing. I, I don't know. But it's just one of these things. What countries are you seeing where things are moving in the right direction and where, where are things kind of falling back? You've mentioned Australia there. Um, Australia is doing really well. Um, they have been for the last 20 years. Um, as much of the, you know, as the painting we've been, you know, we've been painting of the UK this morning, we have made strides in the UK. It is a, we have to, we have to put that out and say journalists have changed their reporting style significantly in the last 10 to 15 years in the UK. So, you know, we have to give kudos where kudos is, is due. But, you know, I've been working a lot with journalists in Africa, in Malaysia, in India, massive reporting problems massive reporting problems china massive reporting problems where you know someone unfortunately is decided to take their own life by jumping out of a building and they're shooting frame by frame photos and running them on the front page until you see a body at the at the bottom of the building i mean that is still practice so i mean you know so compared to that we're brilliant you know, the reason why we don't want people using the phrase commit suicide is because it does have that criminological undertone. It, in, it insists that crime, that suicide is a crime and it hasn't been a crime in the UK since 1961. So, you know, we need to move away from that. But it's also about making it more into a public health issue. And mental health is a public health issue. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, what I often say to people to try and get them to start thinking is, how often have you said that someone has committed cancer or someone has committed a heart attack? So why, if it's public health, why are you saying committed suicide? And it opens up the conversation. So well, there's a lot of chat about why does it matter? It's just a word, but words do matter. Stigmatizing. Know. It's stigmatizing. Yeah. It, it, you know, it made me cringe. My newspaper covered the death of my partner. And my colleague, two seats down from me, wrote the story and commit suicide was all over it. And I have to say that never have I cringed so much when reading a story because it just hurt, you know. But again, it's thinking about what is our language saying to those who are vulnerable, those who've been bereaved. It matters. Language matters. We're journalists. We know words matter. Richard. Yeah, I just want to ask Anne and, and Sally Anne about their research and to what extent do you think you've got, we have challenges in particular types of journalism? So um, tabloid or local or mid-market or at the, uh, at the quality end or public service. Are you seeing that there are some areas that need particular attention? I don't think we can quantify it that, um, that carefully, uh, Richard. I think we, we haven't done our research in that manner. Um, because we were looking for sort of narratives and language and um, stigma. Um, but from the, the sample that we looked at when we did our um, recent paper, uh, we did see that it tended to be more regional newspapers. I wouldn't say local because in, in Scotland, local means quite something quite specific, a very small area. Um, but more to sort of regional papers that were maybe for a large town um, and they were um, they, they tended to be a bit sensationalistic in their ap approach to writing a suicide story but then I think you have to look beyond the individual stories and look at the context of um, where is that reporting coming from um, what kind of publication is that tabloid as a label is one that um, I think is, is helpful to a certain extent but it needs to be more granulated than that because um, I worked in a, a, a local tabloid newspaper and we would never have covered stories in that way. Um, so why is it happening in specific types of newspaper? Um, and also we've seen examples of stories where the, you know even the sort of so-called qualities have not done a good job of reporting suicide. 
So it's, it's hard at this stage to actually specify that it's one or the other. I think there are problems in, across the sector. I think there's a particular problem in local and regional news. And I think that's not necessarily due to the journalists being less ethical or not understanding the guidelines or not knowing about the guidelines. I think the problem there is probably more to do with the economics of local and regional newspapers. They have been devastated um, financially recently. They've lost so much advertising that um, their staff are stretched. Um, you know, that there's, uh, instead of when I was a reporter, you would have probably one local newspaper in every town. Um, you find that they're now across a number of towns. Reporters are, are covering areas they know nothing about and people they know nothing about. And I think all of that adds to the difficulty of reporting suicide. I'm just, uh, thank you for that, Sally Ann. I'm just um, trying to find out if we've got any questions because we're coming, we've got another half hour, I think, or just thereabouts. If you're on this call and you have any questions for any of our panelists, please don't be afraid to ask um, because they're here to kind of to kind of help. I'm I'm very interested in um, in how you actually you 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 try to get people in, on a practical level to change their behaviours and what actually can actually practically change in a very very busy newsroom. Does this have to be something which, you know, because this word guidelines keeps coming up and I feel like people are always going to ignore guidelines. What's a practical way, Richard, perhaps, of forcing, should they be forced? Is that somehow anti-democratic? Is it going to go against everything that journalism stands for? Is there a way you can actually make it legal? Uh, going down the forcing route is um, <laughs> is uh, uh, very problematic well, <laughs> in newsrooms. So, um, but uh, it's absolutely critical, certainly at, at, at the editor at, at the editor level, to to start the conversation. I mean, it really is a it's a campaign. It's, it's a campaign where you have discussions like this. You have presentations to the newsrooms. You get a discussion going. Uh, and, and the discussion is less about, it, it, it can't be about guidelines and it can't be about diktat. It needs to be about great journalism, what it means to produce great journalism for your organisation, um, for your audiences, for, for the sustainability of your uh, newsroom and where society is going. I mean, you're missing the story, you're missing where society is moving, especially um, young audiences. Now, young audiences, as Anne said, are absolutely... Um, are absolutely obsessed by this issue because they are living it and, uh, and are dealing with multiple pressures. So if you don't speak to them in the right way, you're going to lose the audience of now and the future. So I think it's got to be that kind of discussion, probably at an editor level, to try and begin to change the culture in the newsroom. And it's not going to happen overnight. If you've got decades of behaviours, you need deep conversations to change the culture but they need to start and we everyone on this call and on the panel are part of the campaign to have those conversations and put push the great toolkit out and guidelines you know I'm sure that many of you have not even heard of some of these guidelines but now that we know about them there's no excuse to plead ignorance it's, it really is a campaign I think um I've got a question here from Margaret Hughes, and it's, it's interesting because it posits it in the kind of our now our new role in the media as public health advocates in many ways because of COVID-19. She asks, she's really interested in the role that government policymakers have. Are there any moves in the UK to set up a similar organisation as Mindframe, one you mentioned there? And also, is there a sense that journalism recognises that this is almost a quasi public health role? And so has the pandemic shifted? that role for news media. Oh, is it okay that we advocate for this now in, after our coronavirus pandemic? Well, I'll speak to Mindframe <laughs> if Sally Ann wants to pick up on the latter part. Or um, So in terms of, well, we have the Samaritans. So I think the Samaritans are responsible across the UK for doing amazing work. Um, and they are lobbying government on a regular basis. Um, you know, they have the hotline for folks to call in, which is not just about suicide prevention. It had its roots in suicide prevention, but I think 
the Samaritans themselves will tell you that it's, you know, it's a, around, the, it's across the spectrum now in terms of what they support with. I know they have tried hard. They have, you know, Laura Frazier, who heads up the media side, the media aspect of the guidelines on behalf of the Samaritans. She's been out to Australia this past year to work with Mindframe to, you know, figure out how, how does it work. But, you know, the, it always comes back to, is there the appetite at government level? And is there the investment at government level? And I just, I don't think we're there yet to be perfectly honest. I just, I don't think, uh, yeah. I mean, I think Sally Ann and I would both be, you know, we'd be the first ones there saying, how can we help you? We want to, yeah, let's do this. Um, because we've been working with Mindframe in Australia and they've helped, you know, inform and shape a lot of the work that we've been trying to do. Um, but yeah, I just don't think we're there yet. Because we have regulators for other things. I mean, the advertising is regulated, the news media is regulated in other ways. It's, it's, and it's not... Totally beyond the realms of possibilities. It's not. I mean, we have Ipso, but I mean, for newspapers, but Clause 5 is really weak. Mm. Um, and it doesn't go far enough. You know, it only really talks about the methods and it's not specific enough. And there's too many loopholes for it. Um, but again, Ipso is agreed upon by editors across, you know, so why would you agree to be, you know, scolded for something, you know, that's giving you clicks and giving you, you know, engagement and, you know, everything else that we've spoken about. So unfortunately, and James, you may know this yourself, but unfortunately, the problem we always run into with suicide prevention is until it affects you in some mm -hmm. way, that's when change happens. But we're trying to advocate for change before that happens because we know how hard that is for people. So, but what's extraordinary is that it has it does seem to affect a lot of people. That's the thing. I mean, it's that would suggest that it's not very common, but it's massively common. So it's strange that it hasn't affected more people in the news media, or maybe I don't know. I don't well, know. it has, but I don't think that people because suicide is still quite taboo and mental health is still quite taboo. People don't want to put their hands up because. We know that, you know, if a 40 year old man raises his hand and says, I've got cancer, people will rally behind him. They will provide support. You know, his community will be there for him. If a 40 year old man raises his hand and says, I'm suffering from depression and I don't, I don't feel like I can get out of bed in the morning and I feel like I want to die. The response is, oh, so weak, man up get out of bed, get on with it. I mean, those are the discourses. We have the research to show it. That is the discourse that's there. So, and then when we start, we try to move that into a newsroom environment where the culture, like I said at the beginning, our objectivity shields are going to be there to, you know, kind of keep our distance from the story. We don't want to look weak because that might mean we then don't get sent out on that story over here, or it could impact how many front pages I get, or people are going to kind of look at me a little bit differently. That macho newsroom, you know, that's still there as well so it's not surprising that it's not talked about more i'd just like to pick up on that a couple of things that Anne raised there um one of the problems is with ipso you know, the independent press standards organization is that it's only one of the regulators that we have in the uk um depending on the type of of, of uh, medium that we're using um there are you know and, it, and we're in the situation now where you know we don't neatly the media doesn't neatly fall into certain categories. For example, the BBC is a broadcaster, but it does online stuff. It has magazines, etc. So, you know, is it a publisher? Um, so we're in this confusing situation where we actually have two um, print, print um, uh, regulators uh, and we have a broadcaster, uh, uh, Ofcom to regulate the broadcasters. Um, and then we have uh, numerous other regulatory bodies or um, pressure groups that uh, have input into regulation. So in terms of regulation, who do you go to? You know, who do you adhere to? Um, and that can cause a vacuum where actually the regulation becomes a bit, bit pointless um, because it's so confusing. Uh, but the other thing I would say is that uh, what we need to be doing is it comes back to education. Uh, you know, because if we can educate uh, young people about the impact of suicide reporting, and I'm talking here about young journalists, um, then they are going to be much more responsive. I mean, I did a, a workshop recently with uh, some undergraduate journalism students, and one of the things that I got in feedback was 
um, I never realized that what I wrote could have such an impact on somebody's life. Now that to me was a revelation because that has changed that particular student's way of looking at their journalism. If we can replicate that across the board, across the UK, not only could we have an organisation like the UK uh, Mind Frame, but we could actually be changing the attitudes of, of the young people who are going to be our future journalists. Richard, um, this may be one for you. Uh, someone's written in, how do we co counter the newsroom taboo around mental health that prevents people speaking out, especially those most vulnerable and marginalised? You know, I think a lot of our work ends up being impacted by our own lives. It's natural, right, as journalists. But how, how does, in your experience of, of going into newsrooms, what are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? How can things get better for just people protecting their mental health at work as journalists? Uh, so one of the things that Mind has um, Mind with a number of other um, mental health charities, we think uh, with support from Comic Relief, is we've had a campaign called Time to Change, which is um, based in England, but it's about um, trying to end discrimination more broadly in, in society. So earlier on, I talked about I'm going to look, we, we need to look at this problem at a kind of societal, organisational, individual level. And so that that kind of movement around whole society change and, and um, uh, uh, anti-stigma campaign against uh, um, uh, mental health uh, discrimination is a really important thing. When it comes to an when it comes to an individual newsroom, there's really a lot about the culture in newsrooms and uh, Anne talked about this earlier, arguably a kind of culture which is a, um, arguably a masculine based culture which uh, you know you don't admit when you get things wrong, um, you don't talk about your own feelings etc. Um, it really is down to the leadership looking at their, their responsibility, duty of care, creating the environment to enable journalists to talk about their challenges and problems, especially journalists who are seeing really quite traumatic content um you know 20 years ago um you really didn't have this conversation but now we're recognizing the sustainable damage it does to um, news organizations so i think there's a duty of care argument there's also um potentially down the line and po probably not now but there's a kind of legal argument in terms of um your responsibility and the reputational damage post risk an organization is is uh, putting itself under if it isn't looking after and um, the people that work for it. So I think there are multiple reasons why this is the time to really take this seriously. Even within the context of budgetary pressures, um, organizations need to realize, news organizations need to realize is that the journalists are the individuals that are making the organizations work. That it's that it, they are, the organization is the journalist. There's nothing else there. Without great journalism, we're nowhere. And so investing in those journalists' well-being and uh, mental health is absolutely critical. Anyone else? How do you see, do you see, I'm interested, uh, for those of you who lecture young journalists, are they, have you seen a change? Are younger journalists learning about journalism now keener to talk about it, interested in issues, want to do journalism that focuses on it, worried about it, thinking about how taking a job at a certain organization might impact their mental health. Do, are you having those conversations with young journalists now? Well, James, I'll give you a perfect example. So about, so six years ago, I created a unit or a module um, at Bournemouth University called Media and Trauma. And within there, we cover all aspects of trauma. We talk about, you know, from a neurobiological perspective all the way up to then we go into the issues. But it's all framed in how does the media report on this stuff. Six years ago, when I offered that class, 15 students signed up to it. I have been I taught it this past spring and I was asked to teach it again this coming semester because I have over 100 students who sign up to it now every single semester. If I could run it, they've said to me, if I could run it year round, um, they would love to be able to do that. The students that I'm seeing in, in my university in Bournemouth, they are crying out to have these conversations. They want to talk about death. They want to talk about mental health. They want to talk about illness. They want to have these 
conversations about transnational, transgenerational trauma. You know, they, they're, they're crying out for it. And, and it's amazing. I provide some readings and then we just kind of sit back and chat for a couple of hours. And it, the insights that they bring, I mean, we could all learn a lot from them, to be perfectly honest. Well, that's quite inspiring, isn't it? Um, and I'm wondering how people have found what lockdown has done to the mental health of journalists. Um, has it helped them? Has it released them? Has it made them feel like they're kind of, kind of re-engaged with their work rather than having to come into newsrooms? Are they enjoying it more or are they finding... I mean, in, anecdotally, we do. We didn't used to. So I work for ABC, as I said. We're in the London Bureau of the, of the network. And, you know, we've got people obviously all over the world, but London uh, kind of runs the foreign coverage. And we, um, my manager, you know, now does a, a morning Zoom call with everybody around the world where we didn't used to do that. So it was so disparate before. And now wherever we are, whether I'm at home or going to the airport or in another country, we can go on this Zoom and I'd see people in Beijing and Paris and Madrid. And I didn't used to see them regularly. I'd only talk to them if I was actually doing a story with them. So in a weird way, this whole thing has actually been really great for my working life. And I'm wondering if that's what you're hearing or if you're obviously hearing the other end of it. I mean, is this, are we going to hit some kind of awful mental health barrier with journalists or have they found a second life? We just um, pushed out a, um, a report on uh, women's reporting of women in, in COVID news. And as, as part of that, we, we, uh, part of the research for that, we came across some research um, I think it was the International Federation of Journalists of Gl Global Research. And uh, the, they found that the levels of stress had dramatically increased uh, for journalists globally, um, especially uh, for women. So they found that amongst their respondents, 68% of women or 63% of women uh, thought that um, the outbreak of uh, the crisis had increased their anxiety and stress. And it's 55% of wow. the majority of journalists um, felt the stress um, increased levels. Is that job security or doing their job or both? Are they worried um, about their job if, or? If they didn't ask specifically why, they did. There were some verbatims about reasons why. So there's a, a whole range of issues. A whole range of issues. So there's that there's that gender dimension um, which is important. Then there's also the um, race dimension in terms of. Uh, so in the UK, only 0.2% of journalists are, are black, um, uh, which is an incredible number. 0% of uh, journalists, uh, 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 top editors are black. So given the perspective of George Floyd and the stress of writing about that, then the sense of isolation and loneliness when you don't have um, anyone that looks like you in the newsroom or anyone senior that you can talk to about your challenges is another level of stress for journalists. I don't, at this time, have the answer to how you do that problem because I think many organizations now, including our, my organization, Mind, are really coming to terms with the fact that um, gendered uh, situations and race are, are lenses which we haven't spent enough time on. Uh, and so that, that on top of COVID has been a really uh, uh, painful um, cocktail. Well, that's a sobering thought to end on, but um, I think we have to wrap this up now unless there are any more questions. If there, I'm going to hand it over to Hannah uh, now. If, if, if anything that we've, had a, we've been speaking about on this call has kind of brought up some horrible feelings, please know that there are all kinds of resources you can log on to the NHS website. Mind is a great one. Samaritans, you've heard it spoken about as well. Um, and feel free to reach out to any of us. I'm sure that that would be okay too. Um, but Hannah, please. Thank you, James, and thanks ever so much. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. We have shared or have shared some of the resources that have been referenced today on the Zoom group chat. If you can't access them, please do get in touch with me through Twitter at EJ Network. Um, I'm sure we'll be able to put our panelists in contact with you as well, if, if needs be, and if you're interested in that. I just want to take a moment to thank all our panelists again. They've been absolutely fantastic 
it's we've just had world mental health week and it's a really really good and important reminder of quite how relevant and necessary this conversation is both in newsrooms in terms of the cultures in place and the news output as well one final thing this is a monthly panel that we are hosting at the ethical journalism network towards the end of the of november probably November the 24th, we'll be having a conversation on the ethical and responsible reporting on issues to do with gender-based violence, specifically domestic violence. So thank you once again. I'm going to um, stop this call unless we can, unless anybody has any final questions. I'll leave you a moment or so just to consider if you have any final questions. But thank you, James, again for, um, for moderating this conversation. Yeah, thanks for all your insightful questions, James. Very pleas pleasurable hour. I enjoyed myself immensely. <laughs> Thank you, James. Perfect Thank solutions, you. journalism, man. <laughs> thanks, everybody. I will. I will end this call now and stop the recording. Thank you. Then goodbye. <laughs>